preaching to you, but I want you to give back to me because if you help me with some energy, I can bring it to you, okay? Don't hold back, all right? Don't hold back. Don't go, oh man, you know, he might be a little cranky because he's tired or I don't want him to lay us out, you know, all that stuff. No, bring it to me and I'll bring it to you, all right? Well, we're going to need it today because we're talking about a very tough topic. We're going to be talking about impossible forgiveness. Ooh, that's right. The theme for the months uh, in summer, uh, July and August, we're covering Mission Impossible. And we're covering some tough topics. Last week, Mark Flowers, I know he's doing the count right now, but he did an amazing job about how purity is possible. Yes. That was such an amazing yeah. sermon. And if you haven't heard it, go online. It's online. You can even watch it, I believe. I think yep. we even... Uh, have it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Mark Flowers did a phenomenal job covering the, how pure, uh, purity is possible. Amen. I know we've been covering other topics too. Bob Henley, a few weeks prior to that, did about uh, spoke about second chances. Yeah. How God is a God of second chances. Yeah. And that's possible. Some of us, we think, God doesn't want to give me another chance. Yeah. Another spouse. Another home. Another career. Another dream like I did. And he does. He absolutely wants to give you the incredible dreams. But it's going to take impossible faith. Amen. You're going to have to go above and beyond what everyone else does. Because you have to achieve something great. Mm. That's what God's placed on your heart and that's what you want. And so God loves you and wants to give you the life of your dreams. And it may seem impossible. But with God, all things are what? Awesome. So today, the topic is forgiveness. And I know it seems impossible, but we can make it happen. Amen? Yeah. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. And so, yes, we were at Mexico yesterday. That's what uh, Moses was trying to share. Great job, Moses. First time speaking in front of the congregation. I'm proud of you, bro. Uh, I'm trying to raise them up, everybody, if you didn't know that. So uh, he's learning the part. And then Keon, what a phenomenal job with the communion there. That was a really deep concept that yeah. communion is not something you just only experience Sunday service with the little wafer and the fruit <laughs> of the vine. But you can experience communion when you're with the fellowship throughout the week. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. true. It's not about necessarily being happy, but it's about being fulfilled. Yeah. And many of us, if you feel a little bit unfulfilled today, I encourage you, ramp up the devotion. Mm-hmm. You know, go, man, what can I do to have more communion times, if you will, yeah. throughout the week? And yeah. I believe... What it resonated with me and what I'm going to study is in Acts 2, 42. It talks about how the, the first century church devoted themselves to four things. And what are those four things? Apostles the teaching. Word, the apostles teaching. Prayer. Breaking, of, breaking bread. of bread. Which I think he highlighted very well today. And uh, to the, I'm sorry, what's the fourth one? Fellowship? Yes. yes. <laughs> Fellowship. And so, you know, worship and being together with everyone. And so I'm super proud of you, bro. I'm super proud of both of you guys. What a great job. Mm. And so today I want to, you know, end out with a bang, right? Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. But I'm just going to read the first part here. Forgiveness is impossible. Peter had this incredible discussion with Jesus, and Jesus taught him in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times... Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Mm. And many of us, we have a three-striker-out policy in our life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hurt me once? Yeah. Yeah. Shame on you? Mm. Hurt me twice? Shame on me? And I'm never going to forgive you and forget about that, you know? Now I'm going to be better. I don't think it's a three. <laughs> but Jesus says, try 77 times. Ooh. I don't know the exponential, but that's a lot more yeah. than seven. I could even try seven, but 77 seems impossible. Yeah, it does. Yeah. If someone came to me in a day and heard me today 77 times, could I forgive them that many times? I'm not sure if I could. Yeah. But you know what? I got to work on my faith. Because I got to get to that level. Yeah. Jesus said that's possible. Mm. And I think many of us, you know, we can carry a little bit of a grudge or hurt. And we start writing off people like, nope, this is it. This is too many times. Nope. 
this person did this again, this person did that, I see this peop these people doing this, it's, I'm done. Mm. But Jesus right here is saying, no, I want you to have this idea that it's greater than that. You can be more capable of that. And I think today that's really one of the call, that you are more capable than what you think you are. Because many of us, we set the bar so low. We think it's high, because seven times is pretty good, right? Yeah, seriously. I actually think that's pretty good. <laughs> so sometimes Peter, we look at him like, he's a dud, but he's a pretty smart guy. Man. He's probably like, I'm not going to go with the three, you know, strike her out policy. Because I'm sure all the other apostles have said something like that. Mm. I'm going to double that and add one more. I'm going to go with seven. Mm. Plus, it's, you know, biblical number means perfection. So I'm going to go with that. Right. I'm going to sound smart and cool. Seven, right, God? Right, Jesus? And Jesus, no. It's going to be way more than that. And he's like, whoa. I could imagine the expression on his face when he heard that 77 times. He's like, wow. I'm sure he, you know, put his head down and was sad and thought, that's too much. In Matthew 18, for those of you that may not be aware, Matthew 18 is really a chapter of reconciliation. It, it's throughout this. this. This is a theme in this chapter. Talks about when someone hurts you, you go to that person. Well, not really hurt. The Bible says when someone sins against you, mm. you go to that person and you deal with it. And I know last week I spoke about during the communion that hurt doesn't necessarily equate to sin. Mm. Because Jesus hurt people. It's in the Bible. Peter was hurt. I read another scripture today that people took offense at Jesus. Wow. So people were offended by Jesus. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that was sin because Jesus never sinned. So sometimes you're going to say the truth. And you know what? The truth hurts. hurts. So then some yeah. of them don't want don't to wanna admit that, but that's where it is. True. And if it hurts or the shoe fits, wear it. Just go, you know what? I'm going to own that. Mm. Sometimes I hear things about myself, and I wish I never heard it in my life. Mm. <laughs> because it, it, it's so devastating. Mm. It hurts. And I got to go, man, why am I taking it so personal? Why am I trying to, you know, win this little battle when the war is about love? Amen. I remember my stepfather, um, at the time he was a no good man. And this guy, he always put me down. Mm. He always would put me down. I'm going to share a little bit more about this guy. But he <laughs> always would put me down. And I remember when I was young, like maybe 8, 9, 10 years old, around that age, I remember just being, you know, in elementary school and kind of like about getting ready to go to middle school. And he's a decent height. I mean, he's like five, I think seven or eight or whatnot, something around there. And I guess for Latinos, that's okay. You know, <laughs> he's Cuban, so, you know, that, that's okay for them. And I remember I was really short. And I remember one time he came in and says, man, you're never going to be taller than me. Mm. You little shorty. And then he Love added that. his expletives to that. <laughs> and I remember just saying, dang. That's so sad. Like, you know, I am just this short little nothing, and I guess I'm never going to amount to nothing in my life. Mm. He's like, look at you. Yeah. If you get to my height, he said, that would be a miracle. Wow. Well, God bless me. I'm bigger and stronger than him and taller than him and all that. <laughs> Woo! You know, I've thought about being in a boxing ring with him, but anyway. Oh, you know, I think that's, you know, legal, and we could, we could work that out. Oh, my God. But... I remember just being so hurt by him, but at that time, you know what? The truth was that I was short. That's the truth, yeah. I couldn't do anything about it. I was just, oh well, you know, I am what I am. And I remember just being okay with it. I was hurt by him, but when I was around with other people, I was okay with it. And I remember just getting taller and taller and taller, and then he ended up getting arrested. I'll share that story in a little bit. But I remember when I saw him once again, and he saw me, and he was just impressed, like, whoa. You know, sometimes spiritually, people will tell you that. Mm. You're a short little nothing. Mm. You're never going to amount to nothing. People won't believe in you. Yeah. But I love to give second chances to people. I love to build people up. That's my heart. I want us all to have that heart where we can encourage other people. You know what? Let's forgive and forget, and let's build each other up. Yeah. Because the world has brought us down so much. The standards are so low in the world yeah. that for us, when people go low, we got to go high. And we got to say, you know what? 
if, if, if someone offends me, I got to overlook that offense. Amen. I got to be, you know what, I'll take it to the heart and forgive that person, reconcile, and I'm going to treat that person out. Amen. Because now we're closer than ever. Amen. Do you have those types of relationships today? That you could go, man, this person can hurt me, we're okay, we're going to have a cup of coffee later on? Wow. Or are you the type of person that writes people off? Ooh. Must feel very lonely to mm. write people off. I've tried that before. Yeah. Yeah. And I've made a lot of enemies that way. I've made a lot of enemies that way. Just writing people off. Nope, can't trust you anymore. Can't be open with you. When people were only trying to help me. Yeah. When only people were trying to point out what they saw. And they go, nope. It's too, it's too devastating for me. Mm. And I had to learn the hard way on how to forgive people. If we continue reading in verse 23 of the same chapter 18, Jesus, and this is my little insight. It's not necessarily biblical, so don't quote me on this, okay? But when you're told something to raise the bar and you're already doing really well, trust me, Peter was healing people and driving demons out of people and baptizing people. He was preaching. He was doing incredible. And he even was, man, I'm willing to forgive people seven times. Is that all right? But when he was told 77 times, I'm sure his jaw dropped. Again, he probably was prostrate and just said, what? And I'm sure Jesus saw that on him and wanted to say, you know what? Let me take opportunity right now and teach you why. Mm, and that's what we're going to be reading awesome. here in verse 23. So that's my insight. That's not necessarily biblical, but that's how I believe the exchange went. In verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master, who was the king, right? They told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should be until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Yeah. And that's awesome that he said the heart because that means to the core. Yeah. Well, I'm going to forgive you, but I don't have to hang out with you. You know, these are some of the false doctrines going in the Christian community now. Yep. Here's a four of them that I thought of when I was typing this up. I don't have to forgive. Well, what does the Bible say? Forgive. You're saying it. I'm not saying it. I didn't come up with this book. I'm not that smart. <laughs> so who said it? Jesus. Amen. I don't have to forgive. The Bible says you must forgive. Wow. Or there's going to be you know what to pay. Mm. Only God can judge me. So I don't need people's, you know, whatever, uh, reassurance. I'm okay. It's just me and God. That's a false doctrine. That's not biblical. Yep. The second one, everyone needs to forgive me. Well. That's a false doctrine. Nowhere in the scriptures you're going to find that. Everyone needs to forgive me. Mm. You don't, no one has to forgive you actually. Only God. So many of us, we're on this rampage of, I got to get everybody to forgive me for what I'm doing, what I'm going through. That's not necessarily biblical either. Demanding people to forgive you, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're going in circles there. Mm. You have to worry about what you're doing. Third, forgiveness is a feeling. I don't feel like people are forgiving me. I feel like I forgave you. I need to feel love. Mm. That's a whole other false doctrine. The Bible rarely talks about emotions. Forgiveness is a choice and an action. Amen. 
Okay? Right. It's a choice, it's a decision, and an action. Hallelujah. It's not, has rarely anything to do with feelings. Amen. So some of us, we base our life on how we feel. And again, that's a very treacherous lifestyle. Wow. Because me, many people are going to disappoint us. Well, I, I'm disappointed all the time. And you know what? I can't base my life on my feelings. I have to continue to find fulfillment, as Kian preached today. It's not about how we feel. It's about being fulfilled. And then the last one is, I can forgive, but don't expect me to do more than that. Mm. So I'll say, I'll okay, forgive you, but shoot, we're never hanging out again. Mm. Don't expect nothing. The people that hurt you the most, you should actually be spending the time with the most. Wow. You should be like, what can I do to win you over? Some of us are like, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, again, what does the Bible say? It's not about me. Remove me out of the equation. But what is the Bible saying? And that's a really, really deep teaching. And it seems impossible. Yep. But guess what Jesus is saying? It is possible. And so we need to have that heart. You know, next to uh, verses 36 through 38, let's go there. I know it's getting a little quiet. I knew you guys. Uh, See, Acts 2, 36 through 38. But don't, okay, don't, don't worry. I got something awesome to tell you in a little bit. Like, at the very end, it'll encourage you. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, this concept of forgiveness is huge. Yeah. It's part of our salvation. In Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 36 through 38, therefore, Peter's preaching, right? Who would know better about forgiveness than Peter? Yeah. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, he's preaching... Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Wow, they were hurt. Wow, they were offended maybe. Wow, they felt a, a, an emotional stirring of the heart. They were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Man, you guys are terrible. You guys are judging me. You guys are, you know, how can you be with Jesus? How can you speak the truth like that? It sounds so cruel. No, they were humble. They were like, brothers, what shall we do? Mm -hmm. You know what I know someone is a disciple is when they ask questions and they ask for help. Mm -hmm. What shall we do? What can I do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the what? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. <laughs> our whole foundation of our faith, forgiveness is one of the pillars. That's what we were all chasing when we confessed our sins during our studies, studied the Bible, and got baptized. We were chasing, wow, i got to be forgiven of my sins. And I appreciate our faith because that's what we preach and live out. But it's not a one-time thing. This is something that has to continue. Forgiving others, being forgiven, you know, that whole thing, reconciling with people. It's the basis of Christianity, being forgiven. And so for those of us that may not be at this stage yet, I encourage you to chase after this. Because if your sins are not forgiven, then that says a lot about your relationship with Jesus. You have to go and chase Jesus' forgiveness. And some of us, we're taking too long. We're waiting like, it's the metro, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it'll come when it comes. I'll do it whenever. You know. I'm just gonna figure it out when the time is right. You know, we'll see when there's another lunar eclipse or something. You know, we'll <laughs> this is such depth that people waited how long to get resolved with Jesus that day? That day. It, they they made the decision. They're like, all right, we're ready to roll then. Many of us are taking months, years to get reconciled with people. We're taking months, years to get reconciled with Jesus. Wow. Like he's, you know, some customer service guy. You know that Amen. you wait on me, Jesus. Ooh. He's like, I'm offering you forgiveness of all your sins. Yeah. All that stuff you're ashamed of. All that stuff you feel is unforgivable. Yeah. All that stuff you feel, you feel is unreconcilable. Yeah. All of that, I can take care of it like that. If you would just humble out. But some of us, no, my way, 
I'd rather do it my way. And why am I lonely? And why does nobody pay attention to me? And why does everyone, you know, forget to wish me happy birthday on my birthday? Uh, why is everyone uh, uh, not talking to me? Oh, okay. Well, good. I'll be real with you. I wouldn't want to talk to you. <laughs> now, I'm a pretty, pretty patient guy. I think I went out of 10, babe, what, 8? You're pretty I'm good. Eight. I'm pretty patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's pretty good. I can, I can deal with a lot. True, true. And I'm not going to really be tripping. It's true. But for some of us, it's so stronghold. No, my way. Who made you Lord? Mm. You are no Lord to nobody. Oh, man. You like that, Mark? He's the only one laughing. But this is the basis of Christianity, forgiveness, guys. We should be masters of this. Amen. PhD, whatever it's called, PhDs in this. <laughs> we should be scholars in forgiveness. We should be telling people, what? That's it? This person did that? Come on now. Seriously. Yeah. Oh my That's God. nothing. Try this. Look at this betrayal that I went through. Look at this that I went through. Look at this loss. Man, that's nothing. You'll get over that. Let's go have a cup of coffee. And well, how do, how do you know if it works? Let's go to verse 42. Look at their lifestyle. And this is a lifestyle I wish all of us would have. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42. When you're forgiven, this is how you live out. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts or at the aunt's house, right? <laughs> they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. saved. It's the last word of this chapter. Saved. Salvation. So everything, you live this life. Oh, baptism is the only thing that saves you. No, it's the lifestyle after that, too. Hallelujah. That initiates your salvation, but you got to stay saved. Many people are like, well, I'm just going to, you know, it's once saved, always saved type of mentality. That's a whole other false doctrine. I can talk about that on another Sunday. <laughs> but it's not once saved, always saved. You could lose your salvation. And you know one of the biggest reasons we could lose our salvation is because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. Ooh. I have it right here. You don't have to turn there. Here, I have it here on the slide because I really wanted everyone to read this. Jesus says, but if you do not forgive other their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Ooh. Well, will I make it to heaven? I don't know. Doesn't sound good, though. Yeah, not promising. It doesn't sound, you know... Like, like it's a potential. It doesn't sound like that's the optimum situation there. Right. Mm. Jesus promises you, you do not forgive other sins, he will not forgive your sins. So the question is today, is it possible? I bet it is. Ooh, yeah. I, I got to make sure of it. I hate forgiving people. I really do. Mm. It hurts me. It hurts me. Mm. It's like one of the toughest things to do in my life. Yeah. Uh... I got baptized, and I want to introduce a, a dear friend of mine, Rajiv, who's visiting from North Carolina over here. Uh, he's a, a, a man who inspires me so much. I remember having great times with him when I was a teen, and I went through a horrible teen experience, uh, uh, not in the church, but just in my personal life. And if it wasn't for the church, I just wouldn't be here today. I just know it. I would have fallen away and just forsake all that God's done for me. Mm. And I remember when I was studying the Bible, my mom brought me out to church. Uh, yeah. Norma, right? And Norma brought me out to church. And I remember I was studying the Bible in January of 99, and we came to some of these scriptures that we were reading today. And, you know, there was a couple of things I had to work on. And one of the things that surfaced was that I hated my stepdad. He was abusive in the home, violent, a drunkard. Uh, there was severe alcoholism. He would hurt my mom. He would hurt my brothers and sisters. And I would fear being at home. I would just fear it. It was just something that I just felt, it was terrorizing. Mm. I just didn't want to be home. And I would find any and every excuse to try to get out of home. Mm. 
church, oh, uh, yeah. uh, school activities, uh, friends, doing bad stuff. I'd rather do that than stay at home. Yeah. And that was my lifestyle. Yeah. And I remember studying the Bible. They challenged me, before you get baptized, you have to forgive your stepdad. I said, are you guys crazy? <laughs> that guy is Satan in the flesh right there. Mm. Or that's how I viewed it. That's Satan in the flesh. I'm not going to forgive him. Mm. And the brother closed the Bible and said, well, we won't baptize him. Mm. How about that? And I'm like, I have to forgive him and ask for forgiveness too. Both those things. And I'm supposed, then I can get baptized? And although I hated it, I loved the standards of the church. I was like, dang, that's yeah. a really good twist. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that coming there. Oh, <laughs> so I remember it took a few few days because I wanted to get baptized. I was like, I saw what I saw in Acts 2, and I'm like, man, that's the life I want. I hate my life. Mm. I can't stand it. Mm -hmm. And I want something more. This life is so bitter and sad. I want something that can fulfill me, something that I... That God can bless, you know, my life so I can be something greater. And I remember I mustered up enough strength. And I remember my disciple at the time, Julio Hernandez, he was just walking me through it. Like, bro, you could do it. Today's the day. You could do it. And I would back off some days. Mm -hmm. But that day I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and ask for forgiveness. And I'm going to forgive him. And we're going to have this awesome reconciliation talk. <laughs> and I'm sure there's going to be tears both ways. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> So I talked to him, hey, I need to talk to you. He said, okay, sure. We were meeting uh, in my bedroom, and then I started crying. Aww. I couldn't even get the words out. Aww, amen. And I remember saying, I just want to apologize to you. He said, for what? Because I've been a terrible son. Mm. I've had evil thoughts against you, um, you know, thoughts that are related to death, murder, and all that, and <laughs> I wish you would go to hell, and all that stuff. <laughs> And I can't stand the sight of you. And, and these are the reasons why. You know, this and this and that. But I know what I've done hasn't helped our relationship either. Mm. So I'm truly sorry. And I, I just remember crying and bawling. And I remember he gave me a hug and said, that's good. And walked away. <laughs> <laughs> At first I was like, this jerk. <laughs> I was expecting an apology too. And no tears. He made even fun of me a little bit as he was walking away, like, man, nah, come on now. Like, no big deal. And I'm like, man, this guy. Mm. I call my disciple, I felt like a failure. Mm. I was like, Julio, I asked, I, I asked for forgiveness, and he didn't even really say anything, but I don't know. I don't know what to do and whatnot. And he was fired up. He was all like, no, that's great. So you asked him, right? Yeah, yeah, I apologize. I was crying like a baby. He's all like, it doesn't matter his reaction. What matters is your heart. Yes. I'm like, oh, so he doesn't need to like, oh, forgive me, you will. And I don't need that, in, you know, written statement and proof to you. It's like, no. Pablo, you only have to worry about yourself. Hallelujah. If people can't forgive you, that's on them. Yes. But you have to worry about you. Yes. And I was like, okay, gotcha. He's all like, let's plan out your baptism. Aww. He knew I was ready. He's like, if you could do that. I know your faith is solid. You can do anything. Well, got baptized February 99. Joined the church. Cool. It was going great. I started building a relationship with him because, you know, we were talking and talking and talking. And in the May uh, of, uh, it was Cinco de Mayo 99. And so he came to our house and my mom and him were separate at the time. And I remember uh, him just constantly coming over, trying to reconcile with my mom and I was like, Mom, you know, he's trying to maybe become a disciple. Mm -hmm. I've heard these stories in the church of like miraculous comebacks and miraculous turnarounds and miraculous people just becoming disciples. Like people that were atheists are becoming disciples. So maybe this is like our journey to being together. One big happy family. Yeah. Acts 2, 42 to 47. Mm -hmm. And I remember him knocking on the door and my mom sometimes saying, don't let him in. You know, yeah, yeah it's, it's just not a good time. Don't open the door. And I remember just saying, no, mom, I think that we need to do this for God. And I remember encouraging her. My mom said, all right, you think it's good to go out? He just wants to go have some Chinese food? Fine. We're going to go out. And I was like, all right, mom, good. I didn't see her that evening. 
Next morning, it was Sunday morning, I'll never forget it. Mm. My mom comes wailing in, wailing, mm. crying into our home. It wakes me up. I'm like, wow, church is at 10 and it's 9. I, I overslept. So I'm getting, trying to like hurry and get ready. And my mom is crying and my sister and my older brother consoling her. And I'm like, what, what happened? And it was a total nightmare for me. Mm. My mom was physically harmed. Uh, taken advantage of multiple times throughout the night. He had another violent, violent drunk rage. Mm -hmm. And my mom was beaten and bruised, hair pulled out, blood bruised up, all of that. And I remember my brother said, it's okay, I'm gonna call the police, you go to church. Mm -hmm. And I went to church. Cause I didn't, I couldn't deal with it. Mm -hmm. I was just like, God, why'd you do this? Mm -hmm. Like, I just want my family to be together. So why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you bringing this suffering upon my family? And I just remember the disciples saying, come to church. I know it sounds contradictory. I would want you to be with your mom. But I just think coming to church would be the healthiest thing for you, considering the, the situation in your home. And I remember saying, okay, I'm going to go to church. So I went. He drove to church that day. That was the last time I saw him before I saw him in another situation. And I remember being there, 15 years old, talking to him in the park. And he said, look, I'm here to tell you that whatever your mom told you, never happened. Mm -hmm. We actually had a great time, and she's just making it all up. She hurt herself. Mm -hmm. wow. And I was all like, okay. And I remember the team leaders just pulling me in and saying, we're here for you. We're going to you know, work with you and, and help you out through this misery. I remember he got arrested because, you know, he owned guns and he had this long charge. The SWAT team came, they took him out, put him in jail. I heard my mom did an amazing job. She testified and my brothers and sisters testified. He got locked away for 25 years and I was thrilled. Mm. I'm like, this nightmare is finally over. Or so I thought. Mm. One time, my brother, Juan, who's junior, Came to him, many of you know him. Juan used to be a part for a little while here in downtown. Now he's in Faith Point. But Juan is really outspoken. Yep. <laughs> and I remember he went to go visit his dad. That's his real dad. Biological dad. He's my stepfather, but that's Juan's real dad. And we're both disciples. We're happy. But Juan and some other disciples got into my head and said, Pablo, how did you ever reconcile with your stepdad after that? I said, shut up. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Like, let's talk about other stuff. Sports, yeah. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. You, you've never visited him in jail? And I said, why? Never. <laughs> you guys are crazy. Yeah. I'm never going to visit him in jail. You don't know what he's put our family through. Yeah. And I remember he challenged me. He said, you're a disciple. And if you, I feel if you don't go visit him in, in, in jail, and write to him and talk to him and forgive him from your heart. I just feel like you're a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Every time you get up and preach, mm -hmm. you need to be hypocritical because all you preach is about love. And I was all like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, when is this saga going to be over? Yeah. <laughs> and I had not spoken to him in like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I remember I talked to my wife. We we're like, babe, we're going to do something weird on Memorial Day weekend of, I think it was 2011. He's imprisoned in Tracy, which is like east of the Bay Area, about an hour east of the Bay Area. And I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna go reconcile with him in person. Mm. I've already wrote to him. We've been writing back and forth. He's never apologized for anything. He says he doesn't recall the situation. At this point, I don't even care anymore. I gotta do what I have to do. And I gotta go meet with him again and reconcile with him. And I remember my wife, I, I made a promise to her, what we'll do is we'll go and do this boring thing, but then we're going to go have fun and enjoy the other side of our, of our vacation. So she's like, as long as we do that, I'm, I'm with you. Because we need to be encouraged to not just, you know, do all this heavy lifting. And I said, okay, great. And I remember walking up to the jail, and it's an open cafeteria, and everyone's talking about this guy. The sheriff that lets me in says, your dad, he's a hero to many here. And I say, wow. <laughs> wow. He's a pastor. 
He's a pastor. He leads the whole congregation here in this church in Tracy, California. In this jail, in this prison, he's the pastor of this whole thing. I said, I won't believe it until I see it. Mm. I remember sitting down with him. The first thing we did, we held hands and prayed. Mm. And I was like, who is this guy? Sounds religious. Sounds impossible. Like, what is this? And we have a talk. Still doesn't recollect the situation. And I remember for my training, uh, being a mental health uh, therapist, MFT, I remember that sometimes when people act in drunken, violent rages, they black out and they don't recall things. And I had to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I still know he did it. He was convicted for it, doing hard time for it. But I said, you know what? I still gotta connect with him. And I remember seeing him and he was trying to somehow say, I'm sorry for the whole situation. And I told him, I forgive you. Mm. Don't worry about it. I forgive you. And let's just be great friends. Mm. And Ever since then, I've written to him hundreds of times, and he's responded hundreds of times, and vice versa. He's written to me, and I've written to him over the last seven or eight years. I visited him another time. Me and Juan went. Mm -hmm. Me and Juan, my brother, went, and we mm -hmm. drove there, and we saw him. And again, same thing. We prayed. Everyone was praising him. Other uh, fellow prisoners were coming to him and said, because your dad, I have salvation today. Because wow. of your dad, I found out what Jesus because of your dad, I got in the word. Because of your dad, wow. your dad, your dad. Mm. I was ashamed of him. Mm. But then I learned something really, really important. Let's go to like Luke chapter wow. 7. Wow. I'm going to close this out with a bang, as I promised. Luke chapter 7, <laughs> verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with, his, with her tears. <clears throat> then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, "If this man were a prophet." He would have known who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. You know, money is such a tough issue, right? So yeah. when you talk about money, pay attention. Yep. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. When he turned toward Simon, uh, toward the woman, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came to your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But, who ha but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Impossible faith. That's what we're talking about the whole summer. Impossible faith. The only way we're going to forgive is we, if we have faith and love. And that's what we stand for here in downtown Skyline. For those of you that are first-time guests, we live out our faith by loving like Christ. Faith is not something we just believe and talk about. Something, faith is something that we live out. Amen. And when the Bible says we need to forgive others, we do it. Because we obey the scriptures. And I know it may be a tough teaching for us because it's not something that we're used to or accustomed, but it's something that's necessary. Amen. And when you do it, you will be the most fulfilled person walking on the face of the earth because you are truly the life that Jesus wants us to live. What's really insightful about this passage is that this woman comes in. No one really knows 
her what the sin is. But many scholars have come to believe because she had an alabaster jar, which is like a small little flask or bottle type looking thing. Uh, and she poured perfume that she was most likely a prostitute. Because prostitutes would want to smell great and be able, you know, to get business, clients, and whatnot. And that would be furthering their income. And so they would want to smell great. And it was very, very expensive. It's not something that, like, you know, some of us brothers, are like, you know, we put on all the time, right? It's something that you just, you know, do it and you keep it. Because at that time, only really royal families would be able to own that type of stuff. Or you would have to some, have some major cash flow to buy that type of thing. Gotcha. You would need some major cash flow. Somehow she ended up with one. So whether it was a gift from a client, whether it, she stole it from a client, whether she saved enough money to buy it, she had it. She owned it. And you know what she did? All that sin that she lived, some of the most shameful things that she had done, she poured it all on Jesus. Mm. Can you do that today? Mm. Man, God, all that sin I'm carrying, all that bitterness, all that heartache, all that just rotten sin in my heart. Mm. Can we just dump it on Jesus and say, Jesus, you take care of it? Mm. I hope we can. That's what, the Jesus, that's what the lady did, the woman. Poured it all over Jesus because she knew you're about to die. And instead of this, Fragrance being on me for my sin, I'd rather have you do it, have it on you, so that at least you could smell decent as you are going to be murdered, mm. from what I'm hearing. Mm. And remember, people who could pay for those types of services have money. She knew, she had heard things, she had seen things, being with powerful people, if you will, and during those times. So she knew, she had heard stuff about Jesus. And she knew, you know what? This lifestyle is horrendous. And it's so unfulfilling. Mm -hmm. I may have money. I may have the most expensive things on earth. But I don't have forgiveness. And I need to go see this man, Jesus. So she goes. She cries. She kisses him. She wipes his feet. And Jesus does something that's outstanding. That is something that the Pharisees, I'm sure, got mad at him. He's speaking to the woman and acknowledging her as she's on the floor more than those at the table. Mm. And a beautiful imagery is that he made eye contact with her. Mm. The Bible says he looked at her and talked to the guy. So that would be like this. <laughs> Lady, these people. <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> and the woman must have felt like, that's the first time anyone's paid me respect. Yep. The first time anyone's ever paid me respect in my life. Mm. So what must that have done that done for her confidence? What must that have done for her self-esteem? For her heart? It must have encouraged her. It must have won her over incredibly. But the Bible says in verse 47. What was special is that she had an incredible amount of sin. And let me tell you, we all have an incredible amount of sin. Yeah. Yep. Whether we want to admit it or not. We have an incredible amount of sin. I'm a pretty good person. You are, but you still have an incredible amount of sin. Yep. <laughs> but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. little. Forgiveness has to do everything with love. And if you're feeling a little burned out about love, a little hurt by love, relationships are a little sour right now, maybe you don't feel close to God, maybe the love bank is a little low, why don't you check out the exchanges on forgiveness and ask yourself, have I been forgiving people constantly? Amen. Helping people to feel great about themselves, even after they've hurt me. Helping people feel like they're a million dollars, even though they don't feel like anything. And that's what Jesus did to that lady. He made her feel like a million dollars. Even though she knew she had done some of the worst in her. And when you do those exchanges of forgiveness, right? You're reconciling with people. You're loving people. You're working out with people. Great love, shown, great love is shown. Me and my stepdad now are great friends. 
I talk to him, we have a healthy relationship, and it's over, amen? Finally, the saga's over. <laughs> Unless God has another curveball, but I doubt it. I think those are all the curveballs I can expect there. But what's happened even more recently, you know, now my mom lives with me, I can provide for my mom, help my mom, strengthen my mom, and now my mom is a part of my ministry here in downtown Skyline. And she has incredible faith. She's been fruitful. And I get quoted, oh, you brought this person, you brought that person. But literally, yeah, I may have helped and, and done some things. But if it wasn't for my mom's faith, yep. I wouldn't be here. Yep. But my mom lives a lifestyle of forgiving others. Yep. I have to live a lifestyle of forgiving others. And what that breeds in our home and in our family is love. Yep. And that's what I want for all of us to take away with. Man, I got to forgive much. I got to forgive a whole lot so that I can have this love and be able to obtain that amazing, fulfilling life. Amen? Amen. Let's forgive. I know it seems impossible, but with God, all things are possible. possible.